Welcome to this sermon from Silver Lake Baptist Church. Our mission is to celebrate the greatness of God with all we are for the joy, hope, and renewal of our community. We are so glad you have chosen to listen to our message. We pray you will be blessed by your time with us today. There was a young man who grew up in a culture that was largely economically at least based on agriculture. And this young man was a child of privilege. You might say he was a wealthy young man, but that wouldn't be entirely accurate. It was actually his parents who were wealthy. He just enjoyed the benefits of his parents' wealth. And this young man had an older brother who was really interested in the father's business and always interested in supporting the dad. So when there was a rancher's meeting, he showed up with dad at the rancher's meeting. When there was work to be done around the ranch, he went with dad to make sure the ranch got, work got done on the ranch. But this younger brother just chafed under that. And he's probably best known for desiring freedom. He wanted to be free to do his thing, his way, and his own timing, and didn't want to have to live with all the rules on dad's ranch and wanted to be able to do what he wanted to do with his time. And so in the course of time, he, he came to his father and said, Dad, can you just give me my inheritance now so I can go out and, and live the life that I want to live? And the father honored his request. He gave him a bunch of money and let him go do his thing. And you might think that the kid, having grown up in that environment of privilege and seeing all the blessings that came from his dad and his older brother's hard work, would go and invest in his own ranch, right? To, to go get started on his way of running a ranch. But that's not what he did. He wasted all that money on partying, on alcohol and women, and pursuing what he thought would make him happy. So he exercised that freedom that he wanted so desperately and found himself broke and desperate. So desperate that at one point he reflected upon the decisions he had made and realized that the servants back on his dad's ranch had life better than he did. This young man was confused about freedom. And we're going to see that in Corinth, there were some folks who were also confused about freedom. And in America today, there are some people who are confused about freedom. Does anyone know what a meme is? The pictures on the internet with the little words? So the, the word meme was coined by Richard Dawkins. Does anyone know who that is? He's a crazy atheist guy who we shouldn't listen to. But he invented the word meme, and he stole it from Greek. Biblical Greek, no less. There, there's a Greek word, mimiastai, which Paul uses when he says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. It means to imitate. And memes are people imitating other people, right? So pretty soon the things go viral and there's thousands of forms of the same meme, right? I have a meme that I'm going to share with you this morning, Sammy, if you could put that up on the screen. Has anyone seen that before? <laughs> I like that, right? I, I see it all over my Facebook and stuff. It, it's probably more common around the 4th of July. And it's often, though, something that Americans who are proud of their American culture and heritage use when other people are complaining about the way America does things. Shouldn't we be more like Europe and have socialized everything? Shouldn't we be more like this other country? And the, the point is, I have freedom. I don't care about all the stuff you're whining about. I live in the best country on the planet because I'm free to do whatever God calls me to do. That's the point, I think, of this meme. But I also think that there's a lot of people who spin it a little differently. Sammy, can we look at the next picture? This one's a comic strip that I'm not familiar with. I don't know where it came from. Can everyone read it? I'll read each of the panels just in case. So this little like basketball guy says, it's a free country, that means I can do whatever I want. Has anyone heard something like that expressed? I, I certainly have. Uh, often kids, when criticized about their behavior, might say, hey, it's a free country, right? Have you ever heard that maybe on the playground? And, and even adults, somehow we fail to outgrow this, and we'll see what happens in the rest of the comic. The, the wise bear guy says, um, I'm not sure that's what it means. Aren't there like laws and stuff? And then the basketball guy says, nobody can tell me what I can or can't do. And the bear says, but still, dummy is going to be mad that you broke all his stuff. And the little basketball guy calls him a socialist. Because he's stepping on his rights. He's infringing on his rights. He's not allowing him to be free. Go ahead to the next slide, bud. And so we live in a country where everybody's excited about freedom. But if you were to ask 100 different people what it means to be free, you'd probably get pretty close to 100 different answers. And some of them, some of us, 
are abusing the freedom we believe we have and in so doing, leading ourselves into slavery. That's exactly what was happening at Corinth. So if you have your Bible with you this morning, please turn in it to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and we'll be in verses 12 through 17. And as I'm waiting for folks to turn there, I'm going to pray for us. Heavenly Father, as we open your word together, we confess that we rely completely on your spirit to drive these truths home, to affect our behavior, to affect our desires, to help us to want what's right, to help us to do what's right, to help us to live lives of purpose and meaning in the time that you give us here on the earth. So Lord, as, as we look at this word that lays open our hearts and exposes darkness and slavery and pain, I ask that you'd help us not to grow defensive or to rebel against the truth of your word, but to be humble and to be patient and to listen and follow the prompting of your spirit as we can find ourselves set free from these things, that in Christ we can be set free from sin. And that is our desire. We want to be people who are free to serve you and to love you with all of our hearts. We ask these things in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen. Amen. As we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6, the first couple of verses, there's a lot going on. And so I want to point out a couple of things before we get there and see if you can notice them as we read through the text together. The first is that there are two sayings that for one reason or another have become popular in Corinth. Some commentators speculate that this is the result of a letter that the Corinthians wrote to Paul in response to his first letter that we've talked about before. Some people think that this is a saying that Paul had actually used himself in that first letter and the Corinthians had twisted a little bit. So see if you can see these two sayings that he's quoting and then responding to. I think it's pretty noticeable, but see if you can see for yourself. In verse 12, all things are lawful for me, but all things are not helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. All things are lawful for me. Does that sound like the kid in the comic strip? To me, it does. I can do whatever I want. Nobody can tell me what I can or can't do. But then Paul adds some, some extra insight after the saying. But all things are not helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. And I think it's critical that we understand this verse and the following ones if we want to understand what it means to be free in Jesus Christ. Because a lot of us have it twisted, and that twistedness can lead us into slavery. There's a play on words here in the Greek that isn't super apparent to us in English, so I want to talk about that a little bit. The word that's lawful in your New King James Version is the Greek word exestin. And when he talks about being brought under the power at the very end of the verse, the word in Greek looks almost exactly the same. It's exo you say. And the beginning of the words look exactly the same. So when you read that in English and it says, all things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any, you don't see the tight relationship that's actually there in the original language. And so what he's saying is, yes, I can do whatever I want, but there are things that, should I choose to do them, they will bring me under their power. So if we were to take that play on words that Paul used in Greek and try to put it into English, it would read something like this. I am free to do anything, but I won't do anything that steals my freedom. There are behaviors that you can choose to engage in that rob you of your free will. Paul writes about that in Romans, that people who are in habitual sin are slaves to that sin. And it was no less a problem at Corinth and it's no less a problem in Everett in 2017. There are things that we do that in so doing, we turn ourselves into slaves. I am free to do anything, but I won't do anything that steals my freedom. This is something that's really, really easy to see in everyone else and really, really difficult to see in myself. Right? All of us can look around the room and identify the behaviors in other folks that are sinful the things that are leading them into bondage. But how hard is it to see in my life? What am I doing that's turning my own body, my own mind, my own heart and soul over to bondage? It's really difficult to see. And I understand that, so I thought of a few examples that you'll be able to see in someone else to help us get the concept down so we can admit that maybe 
This is true of me too, because I promise it is. It's true of all of us. Okay? And, and the first thing I thought of is when you're a teenager, kind of like the young man in our story we began the sermon with, what is it that you want? Don't you want freedom? Did anybody want to be free from their parents' rules when they were a teenager? And in my experience with, from youth ministry and from our kids and from what I've seen in my own life, there seem to be three big areas that everybody wants to exercise their freedom in. And the first and probably the most common is romantic relationships with members of the opposite sex. Right? I don't want to live by mom and dad's rules about purity because... It's hard, and I'd rather go be free and do whatever I want to with whomever I want to do those things with. So that's one area where we really, really want to be free, and we're just sure if we could get out of mom and dad's house and out from under their thumb, life would be so much better. But would it? In the United States alone, there are 20 million new cases of sexually transmitted disease diagnosed every year. That means every 15 years, the entire population of the United States would be infected if it weren't for the same people having 10 and 12 and 20 infections in their life. Over $16 billion a year are spent on medical costs to treat people with sexually transmitted diseases in the United States. Is that freedom? Is that what we want so desperately to get away from our parents so that we can experience? There's another area. We talked about this last week when we were talking about fake IDs. A lot of people want to have the freedom to experiment with drugs and alcohol before the state allows them to, right? So rather than wait till they're 21 to drink, they make fake IDs. Or they go hang out with the friends who've got the cool parents who let them do whatever they want to do, right? But is that really freedom? There are 88,000 deaths per year due to alcohol alone in the United States of America. 10,000 of them are road deaths due to DUI, which represents over 30% of all driving fatalities. Almost a third of the people who die on the road die because somebody was driving drunk. Is that freedom? And then there's drug use. And for this, I'm just going to ask you a quick question. I have a couple of pictures. Sam, can we look at the first picture, please? Is the guy on the left more free or the guy on the right more free? This is at 36 with his first arrest for possession of meth. This is three years later. He's younger than me. <laughs> is that freedom? Is that freedom? One more picture. Is she more free or is she more free? She exercised her freedom to go experiment with the drugs she wanted to experiment with, and that was the result. Most often, when we are so loudly proclaiming our desire to be free, we are enslaving ourselves. And it's not just these obvious sex, drugs, alcohol things. There are all kinds of areas of our lives where, if not yielded to God, we allow ourselves to become slaves. And so the question is, if it's so pervasive, if it's so difficult, if it's such a problem, what do we do about it? How do I know if I'm a slave? Paul already answered the question in the verse we read. There's two questions that we can ask ourselves to avoid becoming slaves. The first one says, all things are lawful for me, but all things are not helpful. So these people had a saying that all things are lawful to them. It's a free country. And Paul responds by saying, yeah, all things are lawful, but not all things are helpful. So is the behavior you're considering engaging in helpful? Are you going to grow as a disciple of Jesus Christ because of the way you're spending your time? Are you going to be someone who edifies, builds up, encourages your brothers and sisters in Christ if you choose to engage in this behavior? And if you can't answer that question with a yes, that should be a big red flag. Maybe this is something I shouldn't do. And then the second half of the verse, all things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Is this thing that I'm contributing my time to going to enslave me? Is it dominating my time, my talent, or my treasure? Because if I'm God's kid, if I'm a follower of Jesus Christ, my time, my talent, and my treasure already belong to someone. And so if I'm going to take those resources that belong to God and use them on this other thing and allow this other thing to dominate my use of those precious resources, that thing is likely to hold me in its bondage. I'm likely to become a slave to it. 
And you've seen the examples, the big painful examples in these people's lives. And maybe you have stories in your own family lives where you've seen the same thing, where sex addiction or alcohol addiction or drug addiction or infidelity or any of these things has led to incredible suffering for a person who thought they were making themselves free. And so Paul warns us, ask the questions. Is this helpful? Is this thing going to lead to enslavement? We don't want to be slaves. We want to be fulfilling the purpose that God's called us to. In verse 13, we see the next saying that Paul's addressing. Foods for the stomach and the stomach for foods, but God will destroy both it and them. Now the body is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. Do you see the saying there? Foods for the stomach and the stomach for foods. And this was another expression of freedom, that food was made for my stomach, and my stomach was made for food, so I can eat whatever I want to eat, and it's not a problem, right? And legally, yeah, that's probably true, but some of you may have experienced that there can be problems if you eat the wrong thing. But Paul says, God will destroy both it and them. Now the body is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. Is it true that your stomach was made for food? Yeah, it's pretty true, right? We have an appetite, a God-given appetite that keeps us alive. So if I go without food for a certain amount of time, my stomach makes noises, I begin to get a little uncomfortable. People around me begin to get a little uncomfortable if it goes on long enough because I'm hungry and cranky and grumpy and I need some food. And God gave us those abilities so that we don't just sit there and starve ourselves to death. So we have this appetite. The stomach has this appetite for food and God has provided the fulfillment for that appetite in the form of food so that we can live and have energy and do the things that he created us to do. But Paul's saying a time is coming when that appetite doesn't matter anymore. When the stomach you've been relying on and the food you've been eating aren't going to, to be there and aren't going to be an important part of your existence. And he transitions instantly to something bigger and stronger and more important, the last half of the verse. The body is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. And what he's saying is, yes, the forms of meat you choose to eat, which he's going to get to later in, the, in this book, are something that we can be a little bit indifferent to. It's not critical to your life, your relationship with God, that you only eat this thing or only eat that thing. We read in Acts about how God had made all things clean for his people to eat. But sexual immorality is something more significant, something we can't be indifferent toward. And so he says, the body is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. God gave us our bodies for a reason. And those bodies exist to glorify him. Not for our amusement, not just for our appetites. That's the next point in your outline. Our bodies exist for the Lord, not for our appetites. Our bodies exist for the Lord, not for our appetites. And there's a question that I've asked from this pulpit at least 10 times, and we're getting more and more respondents every time I ask it. What is the primary purpose of man? Look at that. Very good. To glorify God and enjoy him forever. God built us for a reason. And it wasn't just to satisfy the appetites of our bellies or our sexual appetite or any other appetite, but to glorify him and live in relationship with him forever. Isaiah 43, 7 says, Everyone who is called by my name, whom I have created for my glory, I have formed him. Yes, I have made him. God made you for his glory. 1 Corinthians 10, 31 says, Therefore, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. That's what we're here for. So we have these bodies that are going to last, that have a purpose of glorifying God. And we can't let that be weakened, diminished, watered down by our fleshly appetites. That's the warning from Paul. There's another reason that we can't just let our appetites rule our lives. Look at verse 14. And God both raised up the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. The appetite for food is something that's temporary, that is in this temporal existence here on planet Earth, keeping us alive. But there's a time when that appetite is going to be superseded by our appetite for Jesus Christ. 
And the only appetite that's really going to matter is the one for him. And so we need to remember that these temporary indulgences, these things that we write off and dismiss as just a short-term thing, lead somewhere. That our lives were not meant just for this temporary existence. Our appetites, even, some of them, were not meant just for this temporary existence. God has raised up the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. You were meant to live with God forever. What do you want that forever to look like? Our lives will not end at death. Our lives will not end at death. That's one of those crazy things that Christians believe and you're just going to have to deal with it. Do you ever talk with someone at work? And I've had several conversations like this. Chuck, do you really believe this? And the first one I remember was about Noah's Ark. Do you really believe there was a guy who built a boat and let all the animals get in? Yes, I really believe that. This one, I really believe also. Christians are going to live forever because Jesus Christ defeated death. The same God that raised Jesus from the dead lives in you and will raise you when the time comes. So if our lives are going to last forever, isn't it important that we prepare in the short window of time that we have here on earth? Verse 15. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? That's another kind of strange concept, but it's not unique to this letter. In Ephesians chapter 5, Paul writes, For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. This new identity that we have in Christ extends to every part of us. Our new identity in Christ connects all of us to all of him. The way we use the bodies that he's given us matters. Not just because we're going to last a long, long time and live forever with him, but because we are united with him now. And the things we choose to do reflect not just on us, but on his character. The character of the one who died in your place so that you could have a healthy relationship with a holy God can be diminished to the eyes of the world around you by the choices you make, by the way you choose to live your life. And so Paul says, don't you understand? Don't you know that your bodies are members of Christ? Our new identity in Christ connects all of us to all of him. And that's a big concept, and Paul's going to build on that big concept in the next couple of verses with some application. He says, Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot? And he's asking that because that exact thing was happening. And we've, as we've gone through 1 Corinthians so far, we've talked a little bit about that. There were people engaged in incestual relationships in the church, and the church was proud of their tolerance of the sin. There were people making use of the temple prostitutes for the pagan religions around them. And Paul's saying, look, if you guys are God's kids, you have been united with Jesus Christ. You can't take the members of Jesus Christ, the parts of Christ's body, and unite them with a prostitute, with a harlot. And he's trying to help these people see that their behavior is not consistent with their identity in Christ. Their behavior is not consistent with the family into which they've been adopted. He goes on to say, certainly not. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a harlot is one body with her? For the two, he says, shall become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. Our connection to Christ extends to all that we are and all that we do. Our behavior can dishonor, can bring reproach to the name of Christ, or it can bring appropriate glory and honor to the name of Jesus Christ. Our connection to Christ extends to all that we are and all that we do. And you can find something about this in the writings of John, where he's quoting Jesus Christ. You can find it in the writings of Paul and Peter. And I have a few examples for us, just to remind us. There's a section in John 17 that we've quoted from a few times here in 1 Corinthians called the High Priestly Prayer. This is where Jesus is praying for his disciples and for the people who would come to believe in him because of their ministry. This is what he prays in John 17, 21 through 23. That they may all be one, as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, 
that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. And the glory which you gave me, I have given them, that they may be one, just as we are one. I in them, and you in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me, and have loved them as you have loved me. There's a little phrase in that prayer repeated twice. Did you notice what it was? The purpose for our being united in Christ? That the world may know that you sent me. The world will recognize Jesus is the Son of God, the Savior, because of how God works through his people. Through our unity in Christ, people will see Christ is who he claimed to be. Our connection to Christ extends to all that we are and all that we do. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. If we're God's kids, if we're Christians, followers of Jesus Christ, we have new life. And that new life is found in a new identity in Jesus Christ. We're not whoever we used to be anymore. We have our identity united in Jesus Christ. Who we are flows from who he is. And so the world sees that these people, these followers of Jesus Christ, are different because they now reflect the character of Jesus Christ instead of their own character. And I want you to think about this for a minute as we roll it back to our discussion of freedom at the beginning of the message. Many people, even inside the church, view the church and religion as a source of rules, as hindrances to freedom. Would you agree with that? Have you seen that? I certainly have. I've been in conversations with people who felt that way. It's none of my business what they're doing with their life. Can't they just be left alone to follow their own free will and make their own decisions and exercise their freedom? And certainly they can. But in choosing to do so, you are choosing to submit yourself to slavery. We see that the real freedom here comes from what? Identification with Jesus Christ. There's a God who created this whole universe and everything in it, who created you, even into the level of what motivates you, and he knows better than any other person you're ever going to meet what it takes to set you free. Yet many of us reject his authority, reject his word, seeking our own version of freedom, and in so doing, make ourselves slaves. Paul wrote a letter to another group of believers at Ephesus. And as he wrote this letter, he shared with them the prayer he was praying for them. And often at this point in the sermon, I might have some sort of homework assignment, some sort of application that I'm asking you to exercise over the week ahead. And this week, it's to pray this prayer over the rest of this congregation. This is the homework I'm assigning myself. I will be praying this prayer for you over the week ahead. Because there's a lot of steps that I could throw out here like a self-help book on how you can be free, how you can become more free, right? We could talk about the two questions we began the sermon with. Certainly, exercising those two questions as a part of your daily routine will help you be a more free person, right? If you ask yourself, is this behavior helpful, you might prevent yourself from doing some foolish, unhelpful things. If you ask yourself, is this behavior likely to lead to my enslavement, you might be able to free yourself from that sort of behavioral choice. But the real source of freedom is found in this prayer. Ephesians 3, verses 14 through 19. For this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man. Catch that? His spirit in your inner man. You being united with God through his Holy Spirit. That Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height, to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. That's freedom. So the homework for this week is to pray that over your lives and over one another. That God would help us to so understand his love for us, 
to so walk in union with Jesus Christ that these enslaving behaviors aren't even a glimmer of a temptation to us because we're enraptured with Jesus and those behaviors have no hold on our hearts anymore. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for our time together this morning. We thank you for the wisdom Paul shares with us here that we can be set free but it's very often not the path we would choose to freedom. And so I ask that you would help us to make the real path more appealing to our hearts. Help us to see the truth about who you are and what you've come to do for us. Help us to walk each day of our lives in such tight fellowship with Jesus Christ that sin loses its appeal. Help us to be so excited about who you are and what Jesus Christ has done for us that alcohol or drugs or sexual temptations lose their power over us. Lord, break the bondage of sin in this congregation, in each of our hearts, where sin has shackles on our hearts. Snap them with the power of your love and the appeal of a relationship with Jesus Christ. We ask these things in his name. Amen. Thank you for listening. If you'd like to learn more about us, check out our website at www.silverlakebaptist.org.